All right, renewable energies can fix all of India's problem. And that does not include education, right? So uh, let me tell you a small story. The story goes back around eight years. I am on an expedition to Antarctica where we are supposed to construct the third Indian research station. This is at an island where humans have never set foot. So we would be the first team to enter that peninsula, which is the Larsman Hill. We set on a journey of eight days on this vessel, which is the Ivan Papanin. That was our vessel that took us from Cape Town to Antarctica, where we would be constructing our research station. And along that adventurous seven days journey, we found the magnificent icebergs. Uh, the journey was difficult. You know, if you have the love and passion for adventure, this, would, this is what you would love, right? Uh, and it was also a difficult journey because of the turbulence in the sea. And then when we finally arrived, this is what we saw. The nature's beauty at its best. This was a place which was untouched by humans. And I will come to it later that why I'm saying untouched by humans. This is a place where you can actually see that there's no effect of humans on the environment. Rather than when we went there, the environment had an effect on us. This is the research station that we constructed in almost 90 days. And we stayed there for almost 13 months. And I know it doesn't look that very nice, but this is how it looks at night. And this is the Aurora Australis that you see on the background. You know, it used to lit the sky up. Now, this was a 13-member team. We were just 13 Indians on this Indian research station, which we constructed. And for one complete year, we had access to internet for just 20 minutes in a month. And of those 20 minutes, the call time to home was just 20 minutes, restricted to 20 minutes in a month. So virtually, we did not hear what is happening in the outside world. And uh, we did not interact with people. So, you know, it affects your mind and your body also. You stay there for one year. And you're very happy, you know, while coming back home. Because one year is a very long time. And you remain in isolation for a year. Uh, of course, we did our research there, we did construct the station, we did the troubleshooting, the engineering part of the station, and we maintained the station, manned the station whole year. But when coming back, it, it felt like an achievement. It, it felt like we have done something great service to the society and our country. So, uh, but then, realizing the fact that we were alone for one year in a place where you don't see humans around, you just see penguins, right? So coming back, uh, we felt that we have achieved something. But the moment I landed on the Mumbai airport, I see this. And I say, oh my god, what are all these people doing there? I thought, maybe they are there to welcome us, right? <laughs> Which they were not. Because they were travelers like us, traveling to different destinations, right? And then I thought, OK, fine, yeah, Mumbai is not to play, as it is. I don't like Mumbai, right? Maybe coming back to Delhi, because I belong to Delhi. So Delhi is something where people would be you know, more generous and welcoming. And this is what I see at the Delhi Metro. I'm like, where, how did these people come in last one year? I mean, when I left Delhi, it was not like this. Of course, I'm exaggerating. It was like this. Very little change in a year. But very much, a, a lot of things changed inside me. And then I thought, OK, fine, let's go home. And this is what I find. I mean, you find people everywhere. You find their footprints everywhere. So imagine you are alone on an island for a year, and then you come back to this reality. And that makes you wonder, what is it? What have we got into ourselves into? It took me almost two hours going from airport to my house, which is just five kilometers from the airport. So the biggest problem that I thought, which I could not contemplate in Antarctica, because we were researching on other environmental um, uh, issues right there. We were seeing the um, effect of ozone. There were scientists in our team who were studying the ozone layer and the effect of paleon uh, to uh, climate. Uh, that is the climates during the dinosaurs, right? I don't know. I still don't understand that. But still, when coming back, I come back to this reality, and that makes me wonder. 
that what, what are we heading towards? So I do a little research and I find that we are the 18, we constitute 18% in the world. So 18% is 1.2 billion. We are 7.6 billion of us on this planet Earth. And you know, mind it, this 7.6 billion of us have only arrived in the last few hundred years, like just the last 100 years, we have quadrupled ourselves. So, so many people coming in, and when we say people, we share this climate, this earth equally. So if there are 7.6 billion of us on this planet, it is seven, the whole resource of the planet divided by 7.6 billion. So the amount of natural resource that comes to a particular individual has been divided 7.6 billion times. Of course, that's not true because there is inequality. But on an ideal scale, we have a limited resource, that is Earth, and we have an unlimited population that is growing at a rate of 1% every year. So UN estimates that by 2030, that is when you would be maybe joining new jobs, or if you're six, maybe uh, graduating from college, or maybe having starting a family, there would be 11 billion of us. Now, 11 billion people on this small planet Earth, where are you gonna accommodate so many people? And how are you gonna survive? That was the biggest question that I had. Of course, uh, life is easy. Life is easy right now. I mean, everybody can get a living. But when you increase at this particular pace, we are growing. So how is it that we are gonna survive? So that led me to understand what is the basis of survival? What is the basis of life? And it led my you know, inquisitive mind to come and understand that there is a nexus. This is a three nexus. And I want every one of you to understand this. The nexus between food, energy, and water. This is the three most essential part to sustain life. Life as in human, not just humans, but other organisms also. Um, except, of course, the other bacteria and amoebas, but we're not talking about them, we're talking about humans today. So the, 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 the nexus, the golden nexus that we, I mean, uh, what is the food, energy, and water. So I am not an expert on water and food, but I can talk about energy. So I would be talking about energy, and how if we control just the energy, we will be able to secure our future. See, we can, I, I am not an, um, a population expert, so I cannot ask people to control population, plus I don't know how government would be planning to control population because it's growing. But of course, you can come up with ideas that, are, that will help the coming future, that is you people, to understand whether we can control one of this factor out of these three, and that factor can control the other two. So, if you see food, water, and energy, if you combine all this, we get life, right? So when I say right now energy, 90%, I mean, if it's not an un, uh, overstatement, 90% of our demands are met by conventional sources of energy. Now, what is conventional sources of energy? The conventional sources of energy are sources like oil, sources, I'll come to this slide, sources like fuel, uh, fossil fuels. So we have coal, we have oil, and then we have natural gas. So they combine together and constitute 85 to 90% of the energy that we consume today. Now, this can be in the form of the cars we drive, this can be in the form of electricity we use. All of them, almost all of them, has come from a fossil fuel source, which is minded, limited. So, if you're going on a dinner, and you have limited dinner for three people, maybe three more join, what do you have to do? Divide the whole dinner in three parts, six parts, right? Maybe three more come and come to the same dinner and you have limited food. The whole dinner gets divided into nine parts now, right? So we cannot keep on dividing the natural resource in such a way that we can feed everybody. 
So why not go to a buffet, right? So that is going to an alternate source of energy, which is wind, solar, geothermal, biomass. And what are these sources of energy, right? Yeah, even I am a big fan of renewable source. But how can, I mean, what is it with these sources of energy that can, you know, power our generations to come? Because, you know, energy is the basis of humanity. Now, nobody has, you don't have to be, you know, told that sun is unlimited. Of course it is. It rises every day. It comes up every day. And I have made my living just by understanding sun and harnessing power from solar, right? So, the technology that is being developed today, windmills, everybody knows what a windmill is. Most of you have seen this, right? But this constitutes only 3 to 4% of our global demand right now. This will change soon, and it is changing. We will have more electricity from the renewable sources. These renewable sources that would power our nation because these renewable sources are unlimited. Wind will always blow and sun will always shine. Because that is what this earth is about. If the sun stops, we all are dead. There is no earth without sun. So why not tap on to the biggest source of energy that we know of? That is the sun. And the wind blows because of sun shining. So alternate sources of energy. It is important, and why it is important for you to understand this? Because tomorrow when you go and become workers, tomorrow when you go and you become leaders of this country, you will know the importance of renewable energy. You will know that no longer can we stand and say, okay, you know, this is how it was done in the previous generation. We have to follow what they have done. No. You have to start something new. You have to become leaders. You have to say, Fine, if my father did it, let him do. I will start something else. He may be wrong for once. I will do something different. And this renewable source, that is something which will never end. Why not invest? Why not? The capital cost may be high. There would be other obstacles. But if you start sanitizing, start understanding about these renewable sources, that is the wind, solar, geothermal, you will slowly learn that the old and conventional ways were right in their time. The newer ways, this is the new you, this is the new India. When you say these sources of energy, today we are for, you know, focusing so much on solar and wind. That is why, why, why are we doing it? Everybody have heard about solar plants coming up on buildings, solar plants coming up on government buildings, solar farms, huge solar farms. I have myself designed, designed so many solar farms and constructed them. How is it happening in such a short span of time, in the last five years, five to eight years? This is because we need something that stays for long. We need sustainable sources of energy that will not end and continue to power India in the future. So these renewable sources are the basis and the future. And you, as students, have to understand that. You, as students, have to take the initiative and understand and question, not just your parents, everybody, the teacher, that if coal is so polluting, why are we still using it? Why can't we power the whole country on wind and solar? Because when you start asking questions, you'll start getting answers. Some answers you may like, some you may not, and some you will start to get on your own because you would be starting to ask questions and do research. So I'll give you a perspective, right? And, you know, just a small, you know, how you contemplate solar. So if I say solar, you see that small little square here, if this, only this square area can be covered with solar panels, you can actually power the whole world. That's like powering the whole world without any coal, oil, natural gas. And it's just this small square of area that will power this whole world. So this is 
the power of this technology. And it doesn't end there. Wind. If you install wind farms on these small green lines, just by installing wind farms along the coastal areas on these small green lines will give you enough energy to power the whole world. And we are not just talking about India. We are talking about the whole world. So, why I am here and telling all this to you, the reason is, by the time, by the time you grow up, you will be using all this information. Maybe directly, maybe indirectly. Reason? Oil is going to last just 50 years. And maybe coal would last another 25 years, 75, 80 years maybe. But you would be lasting more than that. What's the average age that a person lives right now? The life expectancy is around 75 to 80 years. And by the time you are 80, the average life expectancy because of the advancement of medical science will be almost 100 plus years. So be rest assured that you will live till 100. And you would be the first generation to see this change happen, where we defy the conventional methods of harnessing energy and look into the future to a brighter and more greener and sustainable energy. With that, I rest my case. Thank you and have a good evening.